So the Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, has aired the thought that the the war in Ukraine could go on for years and years, maybe for a decade. Now, what might that mean? What would that war look like over such a, a period? What would it mean for the region? What would it mean for the world and the new world order? Because I guess that's what we're, we're contemplating now. Let's uh, check out the thoughts of James Rogers, who's a director of, of research at the Council of Geostrategy. James, good evening to you. Good evening to you. Now, let's, let's think about a 10-year war then. What, what would, could be the nature of that conflict, James? At the moment, the, the war is being waged at high intensity, and we're, we're discussing uh, Western countries, NATO countries, European countries, supplying Ukraine with anti-ship missiles, with tanks and heavy weaponry. Now, that looks like an intensification of the conflict, not in any way a, a changing of the pace to something that could endure for 10 years. Well, yes, but we should not forget that the war actually now is in its eighth year. Remember that Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014 when it annexed Crimea yeah. um, and stoked and fermented a uh, conflict in the Donbass region. So we're already in the eighth year. The issue now is that Russia has moved away from those uh, that level of conflict towards a, a much, a much uh, escalated one, yes. which has become a full interstate war between both Ukraine um, and, and Russia. Now, if the Western powers uh, continue to provide Ukraine with weapons in the way that Ms. Druss outlined last night in her speech at the Mansion House, uh, it's quite likely that Ukraine eventually will be in a position where it can fight back even more effectively than it has um, over the last uh, month and a half. Yes. Now, that's, the, a, that's then an intensification of the, of the conflict. I mean, you're right, there's been uh, the invasion happened in 2014 when Russia took, uh, took, took control of, of, of Crimea. But between that point and, and the invasion, which took place a few weeks ago, yes, there was steady tension in the Donbass region, but it was not all-out war of the kind that we're seeing now. I just wonder then, how does the conflict develop from here in such a way that it could endure for 10 years? Well, there are many ways in which this could occur, um, but primarily it would mean, mean it would require Russia to continue to fight and, of course, Ukraine to continue to fight. Now, that seems to have been uh, a, a situation that has been created by the, the, the extent of the Russian atrocities uh, in uh, Bucha and several other towns and villages to the north of Kiev over the last um, few months since the Russians invaded in, in um, February. Uh, in addition to that, the Ukrainians have had some successes, such as the sinking of the uh, Moskva, uh, and, and this seems to be creating a situation whereby neither side wants to back down. Now, there's an additional layer here, and that is that the Ukrainians, I think, are increasingly aware that if they go into any form of negotiation, when in fact they are still, uh, in some respects, uh, on the counter-offensive, and they've successfully pushed the the Russian forces out of certain areas, or weakened them to the extent that the Russians have withdrawn of their own accord and then focused uh, elsewhere, particularly uh, in eastern Ukraine. That they will not be in, they will not be able to either politically to uh, move into uh, some form of uh, consultation or, or negotiation with the Russians because, well, they don't need to. Mm. Um, they want to take back their territory. They want to ensure that they have uh, territorial cohesion. And supplied with weapons from the Western powers, they'll be increasingly in a position uh, to do so. Yes. So we're joined now, too, by Anne McElvoy, the executive editor at The Economist. Anne, evening to you. Hello. Evening, John. Hi. So, so we're looking at Liz Truss's thought of a war in Ukraine lasting lasting 10 years. It's, it's pretty widely thought, isn't it, that, that Russia simply couldn't sustain 10 or another 9, 10 years of, of conflict. They couldn't afford, afford it. Certainly not at this pace. Mr. Halt, Berlin... I, I will apologise for background noise, actually, John. And just, uh, I've been in, in Germany today looking at the future or non-future of Nord Stream 2. Right. So you can imagine I'm slightly um, in the middle of, of, of East Germany and I, I apologise for noise. No, you just, just injected an element of cosmopolitan cosmopolitanism to the whole conversation. I, I'm hoping I can pass it off as that, but I, I did want to excuse myself with the, the listeners. The announcements always come just at the wrong time, but uh, but we all need to get about to cover, cover this conflict. Um, one of the things I think that's very obvious is that both from Liz Truss's statement, what the German government have been saying this week, is that the publics in many countries in Europe need to be prepared for this to be a long haul. So I think 
I absolutely understand the framing of your question that uh, we all hope this would not be anything like a 10 year war. Uh, Russia, the way it looks at the moment with its armed forces, would certainly looks like it's, it's struggling. But that doesn't mean it will give up. And I think the other side of that is that if you don't prepare people for this to be long, to be difficult, to be grinding, uh, also for the Ukrainian side to have failures, to make miscalculations, mm. to take more losses than they have. Uh, in this stage of the conflict, and they've been grave enough, well, you do then hand some sort of advantage to Moscow, because there is that sort of propaganda line that this is all being held up by the West and that we lose our nerve. We've got a short attention span. Sometimes that has turned out to be true uh, with interventions. and The public will get tired, prices will rise, global trade will suffer, and that we'll sort of get bored and uh, go for a settlement. And I think that's really what is... uh, this trust is trying to prepare people for a yes. uh, different argument here in Germany we might touch on but the same sort of feeling this is going to be long this is going to be difficult yes and uh, and James Rogers I mean, uh, Lloyd Austin the, the American defense secretary that the comment it made a lot of ears prick up didn't it the other day when he spoke about an object of policy being to weaken Russia so it was no longer a threat to to its neighbors now that argues I don't suggest that Lloyd Austin wants to see more more deaths among innocent Ukrainians and destruction of Ukrainian towns uh, than, than 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 we're seeing but equally a long conflict would serve that end wouldn't it and would weaken Russia well indefinitely into the future well, it, it, it might do. I think there are two elements to this. Firstly, in many respects, we don't want this to become a long, drawn-out conflict because that would also weaken uh, Ukraine. We actually want this to be quite a quick, decisive conflict so that Ukraine can ultimately um, prevail and Putin can or will be forced to, to, to fail. But there's another dimension to this, and it, I think it's been both signaled by Austin and also by Trust last night, and that is that we're signaling, when we're creating a narrative whereby we're saying to the Russians, look, we will provide Ukraine with whatever it wants. We will ultimately um, prevail, in, in, and Ukraine will prevail, so ultimately you should back down and, and, and come to the negotiating table faster yes. than you otherwise might. Yes, and, and meanwhile, while we wait to see uh, whether that is the, the next stage, you could you could you could say that you know the 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 the, the direction of events with more weapons being supplied, Britain sending ship, anti-ship missiles and and tanks, and other countries sending more heavy weaponry, that makes an escalation arguably much more likely. Maybe even opening up the possibility even even wider of tactical battlefield nuclear weapons being used by the Russian side. Well, I think it is certainly true that this is an escalation, but it's an escalation, and James is right to point this out, that either you are saying to people that we need to do what we need to do in order for Ukraine to win this war, um, and that does mean that you can't simply get by, I think, this very false divide that was drawn at the beginning and a lot of sort of leaders have had to change their, their line on this between defensive and offensive weapons. Once a war is underway, that makes very little There's very little distinction because one sort of warfare leads into another. On the nuclear point, which of course is always to be taken seriously in any threat to use, Mm. tactical or indeed indiscriminate nuclear weapons is is to be taken seriously. But I can confidently predict, having covered uh, nuclear negotiations in the Cold War and beyond, that this will be used as coercive diplomacy by Moscow. I think they know that the word nuclear causes people to have particularly sharp reactions. And in fact, you know, an awful lot uh, rests on the fact that we will go back to having nuclear diplomacy, which we've had since the 50s, since the the 1960s. Yes, there are perils and dangers, and you need to take great care. But I think just the fact that the word is out there and it's on the table should not stop us doing what we need to do to support Ukraine. Yeah. James, do you agree with that? Should, should we take some cold comfort, if that's even the right expression, from the idea that, that Russia may talk about nuclear weapons but wouldn't wouldn't use them because it would make it would make no strategic sense or sense in any other way? I mean, you, you, I see reports from Russia of the idea of World War Three being talked up on state media in Russia as something noble. It's almost as if they're preparing, preparing for such a thing. Yes, I mean, there, there, there have been some outrageous comments, including very strange ideas about, uh, you know, the idea that Britain actually wants to nuke Russia. That's been discussed on Russian state TV. But I think this is increasingly, you know, uh, actually res- uh, an act of desperation as Russia's conventional capability grinds down and it is being ground down in Ukraine. Obviously, Russia will then start um, talking up its nuclear capacity because it still has some significant uh, means there. In fact, 
potentially the largest nuclear arsenal in the world. The point here is, however, that, you know, despite the fact that Russia is well armed there, these weapons are of little utility in relation to Ukraine, and they're of even less utility in relation to countries like the UK or the US or the NATO alliance, for the simple reason that we are also nuclear armed. And in the event of uh, an escalation in that in that plane or dimension um, that it would lead to, like it would have done in the Cold War yes. to uh, mutually assured destruction. Yeah. And I think sufficient um, uh, disincentive for the Russians to escalate along those lines. So, so Anna, tell, Anna, tell me, as someone who's done duty in, in Russia on your on your travels, if, if Vladimir Putin were to decide, you know, maybe quite irrationally to, to, to authorise the use of nuclear weapons, do you reckon his his side, his forces, his, his generals, his ministers, his oligarchs, would they wear it? Well, I think the oligarchs, so their opinion doesn't really matter at all. You know, we've, we've seen them very sidelined in this conflict. Many of them, if they, they can have fled Russia anyway and are simply trying to stay off the sanctions um, list. So I don't think any one other than, if you like, the, the generals and the military would have any sway over Putin in this, but they would have some strategic sway. We've seen quite a lot of strategic changes, uh, or rather tactical changes, as the strategy wasn't working out. Russian military doctrine wasn't really working mm. in the first weeks. So it is the case, I think, that when we've seen those rather brutal changes that Putin makes at the top of the military and putting in uh, the general who was in charge of the, the, the terrible uh, uh, military you know, Russian assault on Aleppo in Syria, they know what they're doing in order to get the result that they want. And I think that they do have Putin's ear. Whether they would support him in terms of nuclear assault, obviously it's a big what if. Yeah. Rightly, you're pushing me on it. But I think it depends on the circumstances. That may not be sort of slightly cold comfort, but if it, it really depends on what stage of the war this was at. I think if Putin was weakened and made that call, it may well be that generals uh, would stand up and say, this is absurd, you know, this is sort of hit the last days of the bunker stuff. But it's not something that you can bank on. So, you know, mm. you do have to have a strategy that can withstand lots of different military scenarios. We haven't even seen, like, like James said, this is rather sooner than later, but we haven't yet really seen the different ways that this theatre of war could evolve. Right, Anne McElvoy of The Economist uh, on her travels there in Germany. Thank you. And also thanks to James Rogers from the, the Council on Geostrategy.